tonight. Our scripture will come from Psalm 119, verse 133. That's Psalm 119, verse 33. And it says, keep my steps steady according to your promise. And never let iniquity have dominion over me. Keep my steps steady according to your promise. Father God, as we come tonight, forgive us for our sins. We realize that you are holy and we are unholy. We pray, Father God, that you continue to walk with us, keep our hearts, keep our minds, keep us focused. It's in the precious, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Yes, 
I need him to keep me. Amen. You need him to keep you. All of the way, God has already kept us. And guess what? We need him to continue to keep us. Amen. And we need him to keep us all the way. Bless the name of Jesus. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. He is He's God all by himself. Amen. He is, he is God. We're in Acts chapter 9. We look to finish this chapter out tonight. Acts chapter 9. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Amen. We're still talking about God doing great miracles. Has he done a miracle in your life today? Has he done anything for you today? Or did you do it all on your own, all by yourself? And you just know that you are able to do whatever you do the way you want to do it. Amen? Amen. We serve the God who never sleeps nor slumbers. He is the almighty God. Hallelujah. He is the all. Mighty God, who wouldn't serve a God like this? My, my, my. Who wouldn't? Sister Woods, you got something to testify about tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. She got 85 years old. I mean, she just became another age tonight. <laughs> Amen. She looked real good for 85. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And that's not Johnny Woods. That's Gore Woods. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Sister Brown, you gonna look that good when you get to be 85? <laughs> God. Happy birthday to Sister Cora Woods on Bible study night. Came to came to Bible study at night tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. She left happy hour and came to Bible study. Thank God. Thank God. Woo! She knows how to serve him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We serve the awesome God. I tell you, he can bring you from happy hour to Bible yes, study. We're in verse number 36 through verse number 43. We're looking at what God is doing. We realize that God is doing some things through ordinary people, right? God uses ordinary people with supernatural gifts to get people attention to come to him. God used just regular everyday folk. If you look at the background of the disciples that Jesus had with him, that's a motley crew. I mean, that's, that's a messed up bunch. But God took ordinary men, 11 ordinary men, and turned the world upside down and right side up. Isn't that something? The question tonight is, can he use you? Is he using you? Are you just existing? I'm a Christian on my way to heaven anyhow. Praise the Lord, I'm here. I just got good things going on. I'm just waiting to die and go to heaven. God wants to use you even while you're on planet Earth. God wants to use. He wants to use. He wants to use you. He wants to use you. Amen? Anybody want to be used by God? You ought to want to be used by God. God ought to be able to depend on you and use you. Bible study tonight, Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. We know that Peter is on the move. We know that Saul is still Saul. He's been changed, but his name has not been changed yet. Yes? His deeds have changed. So if you want another name, if you want people to call you by a different name, you need to change. Isn't that something? If you want to be called by a different title or a different name, you need to change. People walk around here saying, put some respect on my name. Well, if you deserve respect, you wouldn't have to ask for respect. It's like a man walking around the house saying, I'm the man of this house. I'm the man of this house. 
Guess what, Brother Miles? He ain't the man of the house. If she got to walk around and say, I run this house, guess what? She's not running the house. I'm the man. I'm the man. If athlete has to say, put some respect on my name, they usually say it after they just made a touchdown, they just made a field goal, they just made another basket, and then they would look at the opponent and say, it's time for you to put some respect on my name. That's what Angel said. Angel says, right here, right here. What was she saying? Put some respect on my name. Angel Reese. LSU, basketball star, one of the highest paid basketball college players, especially female. At the last fleeing seconds of the championship, she says, what she's saying is put some respect. And it, it, it spread like wildfire. Folk got really upset. Why did they get upset? Because she had done what another one had done. And it's usually okay when you do what other folk have done. But if you're in a wrong place at the wrong time, being the wrong person, then there's a problem. Yes? You got to be the right person at the right time, doing the right thing for the right kind of folk. And then you deserve to get some respect on your name. So when we look at the, at the text, we, we see Peter, and God uses his saints to bless others. God uses ordinary people to be a blessing to other folk. And the result of God using ordinary people, number one, believers are healed. And unbelievers are healed. Number one, Believers are healed and unbelievers are healed. God has a plan. He has a plan for our lives. And he has a plan for everything we do and everything he does. No movements are lost. You know how when some people talk, they talk with their hands and they, you're more distracted by their hands than listening to what they're saying. And so they got movements that are distracting, but when it comes to God, nothing God does is lost. Every move that God makes is a move for the kingdom of God. All of our suffering, all of our tears, all of our pain, all of our joys is that God can get to go. The Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, this present day suffering is not to be compared to the glory that will be revealed through God, through Christ Jesus, when we get through with this suffering. You suffering from anything right now? Are you going through anything right now? Will you go through it for God? Will you take one for the team? We oftentimes take take one for the team, but we take it for the wrong team. God is doing something. God uses ordinary people. God uses his saints. God used the saved to reach the unsaved. Number one, God uses ordinary people and believers are healed and unbelievers are healed. Number two, God shows his power, and his power is seen by unbelievers. When we look at the text, you're going to see it, and I want you to call it to my attention as I pass by. Number two, unbelievers see God's power. They're able to experience the power of God. When God start healing folk in the Bible, when God healed people, he did it so that unbelievers would get to know him. Number two, unbelievers see what God is doing and they experience the power of God. Number three, unbelievers come to know Jesus Christ 
unbelievers come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. When God makes a move, unbelievers get to know Jesus. When God moves, unbelievers get, get to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Number four, God is glorified. God is glorified. When God makes a move, when God uses ordinary people, when God uses his saints, God is glorified. And finally, the church is edified and multiplied. When God moves, when God uses ordinary people, when God uses his saints, let me tell you, the church is edified and the church is multiplied. What do I mean when I talk about the church? Do I mean New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church or New Beginning Church or New Beginning Church as we know it? The body of Christ, believers. What do I mean when I say the church is built up or edified? The church is multiplied. The universal church, the church as a whole, the bride of Christ, the whole bride. Let me just stop right here and say to you, we've heard people say, women cannot pastor because the church is a bride. Look at how y'all looking at me. Y'all saying, where he headed with this? He don't have a sister standing in the pulpit. That's why y'all here. So where you headed with this? It has been said that women cannot pastor because the church is a bride and God needs a man to be associated with the bride. Y'all heard that before? Yeah. But the fact of the matter is the pastor is not the groom either. Even if he's a male, he's not the groom. The groom died on Calvary. The groom was raised from the dead. The groom's tabernacle around here after he got up for about 40 days. The groom caught a cloud and got out of here and went back to heaven. The groom sits on the right hand of the father. The groom is going to catch a cloud and come back in here. The groom is Jesus. So whether you believe in women preachers or women pastors or not, you cannot use that analogy to justify or to disqualify. Yes. Because no pastor qualifies to be the bride of Christ or the groom for Christ's bride. Even the men make up the bride of Christ. If you are a believer, you are the bride of Christ. And there is no sugar in your tank either. And the pride, we're the, we make up the bride. We're the bride of Christ. Christ. So no man, regardless of who he is, no matter if he's the apostle, whether he's the prophet, whether he's the pastor, whether he's reverend, whether he's minister, none of us qualify to be the groom for the bride. So let me get rid of this claim, eliminate that principle. You need to find the Bible to justify that principle. Verse 36, Acts chapter 9. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated darker. So let me stop right here. When you ask children, if you ask even adults, how many disciples did Jesus have? What do they say? Twelve. Two points here, maybe several. Number one, Jesus had more than 12 disciples. Number two, even after Judas killed himself, he was substituted or he was replaced 
by another disciple whose name was what? Bible study students. Who was the disciple that replaced Judah after Judah's death? What was his name? Matthias. Matthias, right? Matthias. Now, when Matthias comes on the scene, he is no more. Let me put another point here. They voted to get Matthias in. The Bible says they cast lots. Two times in Scripture, three times in Scripture, four, maybe six times in Scripture, every time there was a vote in the church, it was a mistake. Every time they took a vote, it was not of God. Every time they took a vote, it did not, that vote did not flush out to be about anything. You remember the spies, don't you? They go out, they look at Canaan land, they come back, and you know, when you vote, you go with the majority, right? Ten come back and say, ooh, there are giants in the land. We ought not go down there. We should not be messing up around there. We shouldn't be messing around. Then two come back. The minority. Will you believe the minority report? The minority come back. And they say, yeah, there are giants. There are fruits that are huge. But we can take it. Let's go get it. And because of their faith, they were able to go into the promised land. Every time we vote, it is not of God. Ooh, I'm going to get some emails, some texts, some phone calls, and some cussing out. But every time there's a vote, it doesn't pan out to be anything. The other time you look in Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel says, if it's of God, you can't stop it. If it's not of God, it's going to die out. It will cease. Gamaliel says, Leave these men alone. Because if it's of God, you're going to get bulldozed over. If it's not of God, you don't have to worry about it. It's going to shut down. It's going to die out. When we look at the text, the text says that there was a woman named Tabitha whose name ended up being translated as Darkus, and she was a disciple. A certain disciple in Joppa named Tabitha, which translate, was translated as Darkus. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Charitable deeds. She was on missions. She did missionary work. She didn't have to be a part of the Missionary Baptist Church in order to do missionary work. Let me stop here and say this. Many Missionary Baptist Churches are not doing missionary work. All right. If you say you're a missionary, you ought to be doing missionary work. Darkers was doing great deeds. Darkers was doing charitable deeds. Darkers had a good work going. Darkers was all right. One of the mission circles at the Homer Street Church out of the 10, one of them was Darkus. The reason why the mission circle was named Darkus is because Darkus set a good example of good missionary work. Darkus. Tabitha. This woman was full of good works. She looked for ways to do good things. She had charitable deeds on her resume. She did them regularly. Verse 37. But it happened. When it says, but it happened in the Bible, you know something's going to happen. But it happened in those days that she, came, she became sick and she died. Says to us, we can do all the missionary work we want to do. You're going to get out of here. If we just stop right there, we will conclude that regardless of how good your work is, you going to die. You going to leave here. You need to be preparing. 
Don't wait till your deathbed confession is there. Many folk don't make it to their deathbed confessions. Darkness did good work. She did charitable deeds. Darkness was always helping somebody. But the fact of the matter is, Darkness got sick and Darkness died. You know, I always wonder. I sit back and watch people. And watching folk is a strange thing. You can see some things if you just sit and watch. You just sit and look. All kinds of questions going, why do they say that? Why do they do that? Why are they acting like that? At funerals, at family reunions, and at weddings, all kinds of stuff go on. I always wondered, why is it somebody that's going to put on a good old show? I mean, somebody, you all have that in your family? I mean, somebody's going to put on a show, but they didn't have good deeds before the person died. Matter of fact, they had problems with good deeds. Matter of fact, they said, it doesn't take all that. The Bible says that the darkness got sick. This woman that was doing great deeds, this woman that was doing great work, Darkest got sick and Darkest died. We, we hate to think, we hate to think, we hate to think that that people are going to die. But the fact of the matter is, people die. We hate to even talk about people dying. We don't even say the word. If something happened to you, it's not if something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. We and then some of us are, are nerved up enough to say, when something happens, then this will take place or this will go to this person. I sit back and watch people and listen to people. Why are we talking in riddles? When something happened to you. How many of y'all said that? When something happened to you, and everybody in the room knows something's going to happen, and we all know what's going to happen. The Bible says very plainly, very clearly, darkers got sick, and darkers died. It says darkers got sick and died. When they had washed her, it was, it was a custom to wash the body after death because the body releases fluids and solids. The Bible says when they had washed her, they had her in an upper room, a stationary place where they put the dead. How many of you were living when they used to bring the dead to the house and let them spend the last night at the house before they buried them? Y'all never, y'all never heard of that. Have you, have you heard of wakes? Wake, y'all heard of wakes? Now we've got sophisticated, and we call it viewings. We we sophisticated now. We we call it viewing. Oh, the viewing will be at ten o'clock, and the funeral will be at eleven o'clock. What they used to do, brother Whitlock, is if your loved one passed away, they would take him to the house. And they would lay there in the casket all night long. It was called a wake. And the reason why they call it a wake is because generally they thought a person would wake up while they're in the house. Boy, I can see Sister Whitlock. Shakira Richardson has nothing going on. <laughs> I mean, the fastest woman in the world would have nothing on her. <laughs> what, Shakara ran a 10.62? Flojo ran a 10.42 or 4.8 or something? Even with the wind speed taken away. <laughs> and what happened was, biologically speaking, you have voluntary muscles and involuntary muscles. 
And when a person passes away, those involuntary muscles sometimes can respond and you have spasms. Meaning that the body, while laying in the casket, would sit up. It doesn't mean the person is alive. It's just the body, the muscles, are voluntarily sitting up, are causing the person to sit up. Whether the person is alive or in involuntary muscles, Sister Davis will let you have it. House, truck, car, furniture, and all. She's already told me, Sister Brown, she's already told me. You die in this house, it's going to be on the market the next day. You do know when a paramedic comes to a house and they, they can't pronounce a person dead, they take the person from the house so the loved one will be comfortable in that house. You didn't know that, right? So many times, if you don't call in and a person is not responsive, if a person is just irresponsible, they'll try to work on them in the house, take them to the ambulance, take them to, the, and then they would say upon arrival, they were, they were dead. It's because the people who are paramedics, they have feelings like you and I do. They, they have emotions like you and I do. And they know that they wouldn't want their parent or their child or their spouse to pass away in the house. So what they do is they transport them. And that's where you get the phrase dead on arrival. So Sister Davis, I hope they can report that he was dead on arrival, not dead in the house. It doesn't matter. Lord have mercy Jesus. What do I have on my hand here? So these, these they had what they were known as awake. And they would, they would sit and watch the person all night. Or some people just go to sleep and leave the person in the other room. Usually the big family room. And if they, they rose up, they'd go and see whether they're living or whether it is involuntary muscles. I got a feeling that none of you want to take your loved ones to the house. Some people, Sister Henry said she remembered that. Anybody in Louisiana, that's why I, I figured Brother Miles would, would remember that. But anybody in Louisiana knows that. So, so what, we, what, what we see here is they took doctors to the upper room. And since Lydia, 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 Linda was near Joppa, verse 38. Linda was near Joppa. The disciples had heard that Peter was there. Remember, Peter went over, right? It's only 12 miles different between Joppa and Linda. So Peter was there. They sent two men to Peter, employing him not to delay in coming to them. What does this word employing mean? It's not that they paid him money. If you notice, this employing is spelled with a I I M. When you employ somebody to come, you ask them to come. You request that they come. So they ask that Peter come. We're still talking about God using ordinary people to do miraculous things. I said to you before, and I say to you again, I said to you several times, when one operates in his or her gifts, Three things happen. When one operates in his and her gift, three things must happen. Number one, when you're operating in your gift, you enjoy doing what you do. When you operate in your gift, you enjoy doing it. Others may not understand it, but you enjoy doing it. There is one person in this room that whether it's morning, noon, or night, music is going to be on her heart. <laughs> I know I'm right about it. <laughs> music plus children equals to a miracle. 
When you are operating in your calling, in your giftedness, you enjoy doing what you do. What you call to do. Where your giftedness is. The second thing that will happen when one operates in his or her gift, others are blessed when you operate in that gift. I mean, other people are just so blessed. When, when you operate, the people that's joining in with you, they are blessed. The people that's looking on, they are blessed. How many of you say, like I say every fourth Sunday, man, these children are amazing. They just blow my mind. To take 20, 12 songs, put it in their brain, five, six, seven, eight different instruments, and never miss a beat. That's amazing to me. I don't understand it, but that's their gift. And they can stop in the middle of the sentence or in the middle of a stroke and pick up where they left off. They can stop, go to the restroom and come back and they pick right back up where they left off. When one operates in his or her gift, other people are blessed. The third thing. When one operates in his or her gift, God is glorified. When one operates in the midst of his or her gift, God the Father is glorified. So it's not our gift to be dope dealers. That's not our gift. We, if you do something long enough, you're going to become good at it anyway. It's, it's not our gift to be liars. Some folks just lie well because they're good liars. Some people practice lying just to be lying. Some people just sit up and dream up lies. Have you ever seen brothers sitting under the tree swapping balls and sharing lies? When you tell a big one, then the other one got to come back and tell one even bigger than that. I remember one time, that time never happened. That's not their gift. They've just been doing it for a long time. If you do anything over and over and over again, if you apply yourself, you're going to be good at it. That's why we try to channel children energy in a direction where they can be good at it. So they can be good at something that will be beneficial to the environment in which they live. Kobe Bryant used to say those are some those are some lazy basketball players. Because he showed up two hours before practice, stayed two hours after practice. Everybody else tired, and when they get tired, they go home. Kobe says that if you're going to be good at something, you got to apply yourself over and over and over again. You got to practice it. Somebody said practice made perfect. I want to edit that a little bit because I've heard it. Perfect practice makes perfect. Because you can practice something wrong and guess what you're going to do? Do it wrong when you get in the real situation. That's why we have to practice the word, going over the word, memorizing the word, reading the word, hearing the word, letting the word go in our spirit. We got to practice prayer, participate in prayer, doing things in the midst of prayer. God uses everyday folk who are operating their gifts and when you're operating your gift, what happens? Number one, you enjoy doing it. Number two, other people are blessed when you do it. Number three, God is glorified. If you're operating your gift. Let me just serve notice tonight. Evangelism is everybody's gift. The only people that become good at it is those who practice it over and over again. But we all are called to do it. Just like tonight we discover not only did Jesus have male disciples, he had female disciples. Not only are there 11 and 12 disciples, there are many disciples. Matthew 28, we read over it, we, we skim over it all the time. It says, go and make disciples. Does it say go and make church members? If you make disciples, then they will become church members. But we have to focus on making disciples. That's why I say to the women, 
If a young woman walks in here and is too high, too low, and too tight, leave her alone. Just because you can't wear it like that. I'm convinced that sometimes people are saying things not because they have a spiritual thing on their heart. It's because they can't wear it anymore. I believe you have to catch the fish before you clean the fish. And then Titus says it's the responsibility of the young, the older women to say, come here, little girl. Let me tell you a thing or two. But you got to have a rapport with them. You have to understand halfway. I know it's hard to understand where they are. But you have to create a rapport with them. And after you have caught them, then you say, let me help you get something clean. And you don't help them clean up by talking about them. You help them clean up by taking them to the store, to the department store, and saying, this would look good on you. This would, this would really fit you well. And then you look at her and say, I got you. It takes a sacrifice and it takes money. So when we look at when we look at our giftedness, God is glorified, the church is multiplied, disciples are made, people are coming to know Jesus Christ. And when you look at the text, the text says they called for Peter to come, they implored him to come. Verse 39, it says, then Peter arose. When they called for him, he left and he did it. How many times somebody called for you? Did you get up? The Bible said Peter arose and went with them. Peter arose and he went with them. Peter got up. Peter followed them. Peter went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. Why did he bring him to the upper room? Because darkness had gotten sick. Darkness had died. They had cleaned up darkness and they took darkness to the upper room. Now they bring the saint of God, the man of God, the one that God is operating through at this time. God is using this ordinary man to do supernatural things so they go and get this ordinary man who has shown that he can do supernatural things. Now they go and get him and take him to the upper room where darkness is. I want to say to you, we must practice using people who are proven. We must practice using people who have proven to deliver. Went to a church one time. We, we would preach at this church on a regular basis. I think it was three of us. And every month we would preach at this church. One month one of us preached. And we would go and support the other one. Right? One month one of us preached. And down the aisle came a brother. We were rejoicing. We were thanking the Lord for him. The next week one of us went to preach. That brother was a deacon. So Brian, what's wrong with that? He came off the street. He gave his life to the Lord. He's on fire for God. The next week, he's a deacon. Is there something wrong with that, Sister Brown? Sister Willow, is something wrong with that? Sister Bernie, is something wrong with that? Nothing? Sister Wood, is something wrong with that? Ah, I see. Sister David, is something wrong with that? Oh, nobody's gonna preach. Brother Miles, is anything wrong with that? Yes. <laughs> Woo, Brother Miles, thank God. Woo. I'm glad somebody would say it. Digging out, is anything wrong with that? God showed his favor. Huh? God showed his favor. God showed his favor. Okay, Brother Miles, I'm gonna stick with you on this one, all right? <laughs> What's wrong with that, Brother Miles? The Bible tells us not to lay hands on any man suddenly, if a person is going to uh, 
be a deacon, then they have to be tried and proven. Right, tried and proven, right? I'm a witness to deacons being on trial for two years minimum, and sometimes three. Why so long? That pastor just got those deacons sitting up there, and they, he already said they're going to be deacons. Why don't he just let them do something? You must choose those who've been tried and those who have been proven. It's kind of like a woman that's, that's just fall in love. I mean, she's so in love. She, Oh, this is the one. The Lord didn't show me this is the one. And all of a sudden, she come back saying, oh, he, he just took advantage of me. There are women on TV every single day. The man took them out to eat one time. Now, first of all, they go on vacation in another country. And the guys in that country show them a good time. And because they are shown a good time, oh, girl, you going back. I'm going to stay another week. What do you think that's, how is that going to work out for you? Nope. Woman, woman went, went on a girl's trip. She went on a girl's trip and, and they, they had a good time. And this one guy showed her some attention. She tells the girls, y'all go on. I'm going to catch another plane. I'll fly back later. Four of them left. One stayed back. She stayed there for a whole nother week. A strange man she just met because he paid for her drink. Because he paid for one night in the hotel. Then he showed her a good time the whole week. And then he bought her a gift. And he says, this box is a gift I bought just specially for you. Whatever you do, don't open till you get back on American soil. It's your gift. It's just for you. But please promise me you won't open it till you get on American soil. When the plane got 30,000 feet in the air, she couldn't stand it any longer. She opened this gift, and there was a casket in there. She opened the top of the casket that says, you have been, you are now filled with HIV. This is your death sentence. What a day. You have to be with people. You have to put people in ministry that are tried and proven. No way she could know this guy in two weeks. No way she could know him in four days. And when you look at people in ministry, you have to look at this story. Because this story tells us that it could be the death of a ministry. If they are not tried and proven. So Deacon, uh, brother, brother Miles, you, you get the deaconship for the night. <laughs> you tried and proven. You it. I do dub you. <laughs> you it. Everybody else is scared to say it. So you must be tried and proven. So they go and they get Peter. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went to them. When he had come they brought him to the upper room and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing their tunics, showing the tunics and the garments which Darkus had made while she was with them. Let me just say this to you. When you have good works, when you do missionary work, when you do people well, they will remember you when you're dead. The question tonight is, what legacy are you leaving? How will people remember you? The Bible says that these women were weeping, they were crying, they were mourning, and they were showing the tunics and the garments that doctors had put together. There are some people that have done great things that will people will weep over them. Other people, they will think about them for two hours and it's over. The Bible says these women were weeping. These women were showing the tunics and they were showing the garments that darkers had made because darkers made garments for other people. 
The next message you got to get here is that what you do for other people will not go unnoticed. You don't have to tell anybody you did it. These people were saddened. They were upset because darkness is no longer with us. Now, they may have been upset because they knew they weren't going to get any free stuff anymore. When you go to funerals, you hear people say, he did this to me, she did this to me, and now I'm upset. They don't come out and say it, but what they're really saying, I'm upset because I ain't going to get that no more. Darkness had made while she was with them. Verse 40. But Peter put them all out. Here it is, Peter, showing up at somebody else's house. People are weeping. People are torn up. I mean, their feelings are hurt. And they can't do anything about it. Let me tell you something. These people are hurting so bad, they're weeping so loudly. And let me tell you, during these times, they had professional mourners. If you recall Jesus, when he was here, he put folk out. They were professional mourners. Now, these people were hurt. But Peter put all of them out. Peter put them all out. The Bible didn't say he had an attitude. He just put them out. I want to tell you tonight, some blessings that you're going to bless, be blessed with, you can't be blessed with some folk. Some things that you're trusting God to do, you can't tell everybody. Amen. Some things that God is doing in your life right now, you don't want to take your sister, your brother, your friend, your dog, your, your crony with you. Some things that God is going to do in your life, some people you can't even murmur it to. Peter said, y'all got to go. Says to us tonight that we got to evict some folk. We got to get rid of some folk. And you know the thing about it is, it's not hard for you to know who you got to get rid of. The same person that did you dirty last year still doing you dirty this year. The same person that didn't have faith last year still doesn't have faith this year. I'm telling you, that's a problem. You cannot exist in success if you're the smartest person in the room. If you always the smartest person in the room, you're going to be limited. Matter of fact, you're going to hit your ceiling already. So don't be jealous when there's somebody else in the room that's more spiritual than you are, that's smarter than you are, that talk to God more than you do. Let me tell you, you need to glean from those people. You need to be glad they're there. You need to be like the children in elementary, junior high, and high school. I'm so glad to sit next to the A student because every now and then the A student will at least look at me Y'all get that when you get home. You need to be glad to be in the room where somebody can, can, can push you and pressure you to a new level. level. A few years ago, media dogged out Chicago. They, they just, the girl got problems. She's a mental case. She has same-sex tendencies. Her grandmama just died, her mama just died, whatever it was. She cannot see, and we cannot see her being a victim. And that's why when she won that 100 brother miles, she said, no thank you, no thank you, no thank you, no thank you. But she went to the same news reporter who interviewed her, and she said, I'll be back. And so they want to say, well, she's back. But the little ghetto girl said, I ain't back, I'm better. <laughs> it says to us, don't, don't let people limit who we are. 
And don't let your mistake become a lifetime sentence. Every time, within the last 10 yards, all of a sudden the newscasters and the commentators' voice change. <gasps> there comes Chicago Richards. Richardson. God wants to do some things with you that no one else has done and that you've never done. But you have to let God use you. You have to apply yourself. You have to keep trusting him. You have to stay focused. You have to put in the work. The Bible said Peter put them all out. Then Peter kneeled down and prayed. The next thing you need to understand that the power to your success only comes from God. How powerful you are in the spirit, you need to trust God with it. The power of your blessings going to come from God. The Bible says that, that promotion doesn't come from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but it only comes from God who is in heaven. Your promotion. You know, major corporations have a, has a way, corporations have a way of threatening you and telling you you're not qualified or you're overqualified or you're not fit. And every time they told me, my statement was, to their face, let's see what God has to say about it. There was no threatening, there was no loud talking, there was no calling them a liar. My statement is, let's see what God has to say about it. God is our power source. He is our only source. We have to depend on God. I got calls from doctors. I said, man, I ain't doing that. Matter of fact, I told the nurse, I said, you tell Dr. Williams that, that they're gonna have to, he's going to have to take up a love offering for me in the office in order for me to go to that doctor. I mean, they know how to suck your, your, your insurance dry and suck your pocket dry. We have to depend on God. And when we depend on God, it doesn't mean throw your doctors away, throw your lawyers away. It means that your ultimate source, you realize it is from God. The Bible says he, kneeled, he knelt down and prayed and, turn, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. The other point I want to make to you tonight, when you turn to God, don't be surprised when God answers. Right. When you turn to God, expect God to give you what you ask. That's what faith is about. When you kneel down and pray, and you have a history with God, and all of us in this room have this history with God, and we know sometimes God didn't answer the way we wanted him to answer. But every time we ask him for something, we ought to ask him for something expecting it to happen. Man. Regardless of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what the people say. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what the doctor says. My wife looked at me like I'm crazy when I, I, I we ain't doing that. I'm not doing that. But the doctor said, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Some people use GPS for everything. I have learned that GPS will take you the pair land and back when you're coming from Houston to get to this church. They like to take you all the way around the loop when you were just two miles where you were going. And when I look at it and I know halfway where I'm going, I said, I'm not doing that. No, no. But that's what it said. No, I'm not doing that. I looked, I looked at a map today, and I'm looking at it, and it has a big old curve that goes all the way to, to all the way to Crosby, Texas, and then it comes back to 45. Then when I look at the map, it says two hours and 25 minutes going all the way through Crosby, come back to 45, going toward Dallas. I said, I'm doing that. And I'm looking at 
looking at the same map, and it shows me where 59 goes straight north, and then it connects to the same point that I'm going to. But if I trust GPS, if I trust what other folk are saying, don't you know, I would spend hours in the wilderness like the children of Israel did. The Bible says that, that Peter kneeled down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And guess what happened? And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Dead girl. Darkest is all the way dead. She's a dead girl. She is dead. She is breathing nothing dead. Her heart is not beating dead. She's all the way dead. Peter says, arise. And she sat up and opened her eyes. She opened her eyes and sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Check this out. He gave her the right hand of welcome and fellowship. She's alive now. He, he gives her his hand. He lifts her up. Gives her the right hand of welcome and fellowship. Then he called the same folk that were weeping, the same folk that was not trusting. He called them and he gives them her back to them alive. Verse 42. And it came and it became known through all of Joppa. Through all Joppa. How much of Joppa? Through all Joppa. Through all of Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. Few closing thoughts here. God does great things, and when he does great things, he has a purpose. And the purpose, as we see here in verse number 42, that many believed. It's not enough for us to bless somebody. It's not enough for us to be blessed. We must bless people and we must be blessed in order that other folk will believe. God wants to be glorified. God wants believers to come, unbelievers to get to believe in him. He wants believers to grow in faith. So God create these miracles. Every now and then we see all these great miracles. And the miracle in your life is just so others will believe. So, other, so you can stand, you go through some things for five years, ten years, you're still calling on God, you're faithful to God, and then in ten minutes you can sit on a bench in the park and, tell, and change somebody's life. Won't he do it? Have you tried him? He's able. The Bible says, and he be, it became known throughout Joppa, and many people believed on the Lord. It says that he stayed in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. The reason why we need to point out Simon the Tanner, because he had an undesirable career. His occupation was what we call the undertaker. It was an undesirable position. It was a position that when 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 Simon the Tanner showed up, nobody wanted to see him because he wasn't bringing good news. And Peter, here it is, Peter that has messed up the undertaker's economy. The Bible said he stayed with them many days in Joppa. My final point is God take two different interests and put them together. So he can be glorified. God is able to take people who are at odds with each other and put them together so he can be glorified. The question tonight, do you want to be a statistic or a testimony? Do you want to be a statistic? Do you want to be just like everybody else? That's a statistic. Or do you want to be a testimony? One that will trust God in the middle of all this stuff going on. Here it is, Peter is hanging out with an undertaker, and the undertaker didn't even do the same thing, Peter. Peter gives life, the undertaker takes care of death. 
Will you be a statistic? Will you be somebody that will fall out with God because he hadn't arrived yet? Or will you keep trusting him and be a living, walking, breathing testimony just for him? Jesus was a testimony. You see, when you look at the ordinary people that God uses, first of all, he uses Christ to get Saul's attention and change him. Secondly, he used Ananias to relieve Saul of his blindness and restore his sight. Then Peter is used to deliver Aeneas from a bedridden situation. God uses ordinary people. Now he uses Peter to restore darker sight. God used Christ to get Saul's attention. But above all, God is still using Jesus the Christ to save the whole world. He did it on Calvary. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose, Jesus was seen so that we could get to know God through Jesus Christ. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Just like darkness lives again, mankind can also live. If you've never trusted Jesus as your personal savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity. You can get to know Jesus right here, right now. Just bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've honestly prayed this prayer, receiving Jesus as your Savior, you're on your way to heaven, you are born again, you have a new life, and God wants to use you. When we thank God for who he is and what he's already done, we serve the awesome and the amazing God. God has, has blessed us once again to, to fellowship with him and to be a part of what he is doing. Amen? Amen. It is often time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's time to give to the Lord. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle, our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gifts, you can do that by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. Four, five, nine. We are lifting Sister Wallace, Sister Beverly Wallace in prayer. We are lifting Sister Brown and Sister Virginia Brown and her family in prayer. Who else are we lifting? We are lifting the Whitlocks in prayer. We are praying specifically for, for Brother Whitlock and Sister Whitlock. We are lifting all these in prayer and we are asking God to do great things as we go forward. Yes, sir. We are praying for the Whitlocks next week. Um, special prayer. If you would, if you would join me at 12 noon next week to lift the, the Whitlocks in prayer that whole week. Will you do that for me? Uh, if, you, if you get your lunch break at 12 noon, let us all bombard heaven all at the same time and watch what God does. Amen. So let's do that. We're praying for all those on our prayer list and we're asking God to do great things. We already discovered that God can use ordinary people to do supernatural and extraordinary things. Why don't we stand to be dismissed?
Father God, we thank you now. We honor you. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for just being God. For choosing us. For blessing us. Father, we thank you, Father, for anointing us for your service. We pray that you bless us now and keep us. We pray, Father God, that you continue to walk with us. Bless our church to continue to look to heaven. We know you as the great power source. We know you, Father God, that when there are rolling blackouts, you are still our source. Bless us, Lord, as we go forth. Bless us to continue to be shining lights for other men, women, boys, and girls to see. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will show the world what God will do with ordinary people. Give us miracles in our midst. Heal and bless in our midst. Speak to the doctors and our lawyers through the miracles that you would do with us. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to anoint us for service. Bless us to be on fire for winning souls. Bless us to look to you, the author and the finish of our faith. Now, Lord, we thank you for our belief. And we ask you to help our unbelief. Lord, we ask you that you will get the glory. That unbelievers will turn to you. That the church will multiply. That the church will be edified. That lives will be changed. Hope will be renewed. Souls will be saved. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you.